Thanks, Barbara, for that uh, introduction. Yes, it was a long time ago. And thank you for the invitation to be here. For me, it's always a special privilege to bring to you that place where my heart remains after having served there, uh, the Holy Land, and to give just a wee bit of voice to the voiceless. So I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here this morning. It's for me a bit of a duty as well as a privilege to speak about the Holy Land. And what I'd like to do this morning in consideration of this Holy Land service is to reflect on the church in the most remote, isolated corner of that land, the Gaza Strip, which bears the dubious distinction of perhaps being the most isolated place on the planet due only to human sin. This place is a microcosm of the reality facing the church in the very place of its origin, historic Palestine. And just as you welcomed me, I'd like to pass on to you the welcome visiting groups I used to bring from Jerusalem nearly 30 years ago around the time of the Oslo Accord when I visited the, uh, from the West Bank would receive upon entering Gaza. And that welcome will in and of itself, I think, set the context for understanding Gaza. Because traveling unaccompanied through the maze of Israel's occupation forces in Gaza at the time was deemed too dangerous, one of the great saints of the Palestinian church there, a widely respected layman, would have to come to meet us at the crossing. And he would greet us with what might be thought of as a spoiler alert, for our pending visit. Welcome to hell. Now, that had a kind of uh, enjoyable edge for me because as the vicar of Gaza, the Anglican visit vicar of Gaza, I uh, carried the unique title, I will never be um, uh, celebrated otherwise, I'm sure. Uh, I carried the rather unique title that no pastor uh, will ever earn. I was the vicar of hell. As I reflect on the church in Gaza this morning, I do so because in this isolated place, the marginalized church community is a unique light in the darkness. Through its remarkable institutions, which are partners of the United Church of Canada, it bears comment that so much of our identity as Christians, in fact, what it is to be church, is shaped by this first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthian church just read. We heard St. Paul speaking of the need for church unity to open his letter, apparently around 60 AD when it was written, there was no United Church of Corinth, much less of Canada. We hear St. Paul then writing about the cross. We hear the first account in this letter of the Last Supper. We hear him spend three whole chapters, 12 to 14, directly describing what church is, beginning with his body of Christ metaphor. And let's not exclude from those three chapters, perhaps the best known chapter 13 on love. You've probably heard it at maybe too many weddings, often taken out of context, distorting Paul's very message on love. Love is for him and ought to be for us very much to do with being church. At the beginning of today's reading, immediately after the introductory pro forma greeting and thanksgiving, Paul launches in, now I appeal to you, or now let's get down to business, he's saying, and that business is to proclaim the necessity of church unity, if the message, as he calls it, is to have any meaning and content. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, 
It is the power of God. Something that the Gazan church lives by. St. Paul is defining what it's all about to be church. Proclaiming the message of the cross, not with eloquent wisdom. That's one thing. But living by the sign and wisdom of the cross in Gaza is quite another thing. As our host in Gaza introduced it, Gaza was hell at the time of Oslo. And if that was the case, I'm confident that there is no single word to describe it now. How do you describe being confined to what is now widely understood as the world's largest open-air prison? All two million Palestinians of the entire tiny Gaza Strip, compounded by living under a blockade, a siege, with the majority deprived of everything from clean drinking water to medical supplies. And if that were not enough, facing aerial bombing by Israeli fighter jets at will. Beyond hell, perhaps. Year after year, decade after decade, a willfully and artfully designed structural oppression and violence at the level of war crimes. In that context, after 2,000 years of witness of the church in Gaza, the Palestinian Christian community, under threat of extinction, hanging on by its fingernails, is truly living by the message of the cross, while, of course, carrying a burdensome one. I remember when I was there at a time where it was very risky for expatriates to be there on their own. I was put in a car with a woman and she grabbed my arm and she said, you're a priest, aren't you? And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm done for. And she said, we haven't had communion here in 10 years. That started my ministry in Gaza from which we ended up building a church, which was later targeted by an Israeli laser-guided missile. This woman wanted communion. She wanted connection with something bigger than her isolation, because that's what it is to be church. In such an ancient culture, Individualism, individualism as we know it, and the idea of really living an individual faith is not as meaningful as belonging to the community of faith for Christians, the church, or what St. Paul calls the body of Christ. Thus, as much as faith is individual, it's even more in Palestine an identity. There's a story about the Canadian tourist going into the market in Jerusalem and being asked by the Arab shopkeeper, are you Christian, Muslim, or Jewish? She says, I'm an atheist. And he says, ah, I understand. But are you a Christian atheist, Muslim atheist, or Jewish atheist? <laughs> it's very much about identity. And doubly so for a refugee. Most of the Gazans, most people who live in Gaza, are in fact refugees. I remember a very proud man, a Christian leader in Gaza, breaking down in tears telling me the story about how he became a refugee. He was in Jaffa as a child, 10 years old, and the place was under attack by then the Zionist underground forces. Israel hadn't yet been named or claimed as a state. Forces that were thought by the British to be terrorists 
And like so many, his parents didn't know what to do, so they ran to the coast and they hired a raft because all the boats were gone, hoping that it would take him to safety. And there wasn't enough room on the raft for his parents, just his brother, hoping it would take him to safety up north, maybe in Haifa, maybe in Lebanon. But the winds carried them down to Gaza, and he never saw his parents again. That's a story of the Christian community there, indeed, of the entire or majority of Palestinians in Gaza. Up until at least the shimmer of the 1993 Oslo Accords, Palestinians without any universities allowed to function for years had the second highest number of degrees per capita in the world after Americans. Why? Because as they were always quick to point out, as refugees, the dispossessed know that education is the one possession that cannot be taken from them. And likewise, neither can religious identity, their belief. And so the title of this sermon, Believing in the Darkness, the darkness, the word used by Isaiah this morning. The Christians in Gaza continue to believe and are the very light that Isaiah talks about coming in the darkness. But what keeps them going? in those circumstances. I dare say it's hope. An authentic hope that doesn't need to be optimistic. Indeed, if it relied on such a need, that hope would die. Nor does it need to have, to possess, but to give. Talking to a colleague earlier this week who just got back from Gaza on Sunday, here in Canada. He was telling me about a project that I'll elaborate a little bit more on in the global gossip to support job creation for the few Christians there. And in visiting one of the families, one of the Christian families, they were talking about the importance of jobs as a way of keeping them there. Otherwise, they would be compelled to leave because they can't survive. Why? Because with a job, they could give back to their community. <laughs> Imagine in our society having such a beautiful motive. This is precisely the kind of love that Paul proclaims in chapter 13, proclaiming Christ crucified, self-giving love. It is through this self-giving witness to Christ crucified that the church in Gaza is a beacon of hope, a light in the darkness. This tiny Christian minority of less than 1% of the population prior to Oslo was after the United Nations the largest provider of social services in Gaza through their clinics, hospitals, vocational training centers, and other institutions. They serve Muslim and Christian Palestinians without discrimination and are deeply integrated into Palestinian society and deeply respected. So we heard Isaiah prophesy just such a hope this morning, his prophecy that those who walk in darkness will have a Messiah, a Christ, to come to break the yoke of their burden and the rod of their oppressor, he says. St. Paul proclaims that such a hope is fulfilled, shockingly, in a crucified Christ. Turning to chapter 13, he begins, let me show you a yet more excellent way. And then the climax of his love poem, he concludes, faith, hope, and love, these three abide. 
That's the struggling church in Gaza. Faith, believing in the darkness, hoping, and self-giving love by the cross. If they didn't know this Psalm 27 individually, which we sung this morning, it seems to be indelibly emblazoned on the mind of the Gazan church. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, My heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Dwell in the house of the Lord, the church. The identity of this minority of minority communities in Gaza. So arriving there 25 years ago, you would hear their welcome to their hell. But what about leaving? What about us? What about leaving behind the misery that was witnessed and the Christian community there in so many ways, light in the darkness? Well, there were also parting words ringing in the ears of every visitor to the church community. Do not forget us. And frankly, that's why I'm here this morning. I somehow, in small ways, just try and live out that request. In describing the body of Christ in chapter 12, St. Paul goes to the heart of it. He says, when one suffers in the body of Christ, all suffer. That's perhaps why he begins his letter with an emphasis on unity, as we heard this morning, as sharing in the pain as well as the joy is precisely what it is to be church. The church-related organizations in Palestine produced a document three years ago, which they sent to the World Council of Churches, And they have a term for this, this sharing in the suffering, this empathy, which means literally together in suffering. It's called costly solidarity. This necessarily involves working for justice to lift the yoke of oppression. It is or ought to be a mark of the church a cross-oriented church proclaiming the power of the cross. The hope of Gazan Christians is nourished with every act of solidarity, helping them remember that they are not forgotten, that they are part of something greater, a greater communion. And greater it is. They know well, the opening words of the muezzin, the call from the minaret, Allahu Akbar, which doesn't mean God is great, by the way. It means God is greater. Empathy, literally together in suffering and sacrificial love, nourishes a faith for them that there is something greater out there which draws them into each challenging day, something greater. It is in such an understanding of being church that nurtures their hope, supported by our solidarity, to which they so beautifully bear witness in Gaza and are truly a beacon of hope in that isolated corner of the world. Pray for them. Amen.